Uh, as you know by now, if you've been watching the show, we um, post these every Wednesday on eSkeptic, and uh, the podcast is growing in, in popularity, so we do appreciate your support for that. It's really part of the overall educational um, project of the Skeptic Society and Skeptic Magazine. We are a 501c3 nonprofit California corporation, so your donations are tax deductible and we do appreciate your support, which you can offer at skeptic.com slash donate through PayPal or Patreon or checks or credit cards or uh, any of the available technologies there on our own webpage for making donations. And um, as I find my voice here I, uh, on the podcast, I guess I'd say our our niche amongst all the podcasts, and there are a lot of really good podcasts, so <clears throat> uh, I've tried to ca- kind of carve out a niche would be science topics related to new books by scientists. And that's what I've been doing. Today's author is uh, Richard Rangham. His book is The Goodness Paradox, The Strained Relationship Between Virtue and Violence in Human Evolution. I really think this is a super important book. I I read it in audio and abridged, and it was a great read. Uh, Richard is the Ruth B. Moore Professor of Biological Anthropology at Harvard University. He's the author of Catching Fire, How Cooking Made Us Human, and Demonic Males, Apes, and the Origins of Human Violence, which he wrote with Dale Peterson. Dr. Rangham has studied wild chimpanzees in Uganda since 1987. He's received a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship and is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and of the British Academy. I think of uh, The Goodness Paradox as something of the third of his trilogy, his first book, uh, Demonic Males was followed by Catching Fire. Uh, Demonic Males really uh, in the 1990s, 97, I think that was published, was uh, really right in the middle of those culture wars in anthropology and psychology and uh, and primatology about the um, evolutionary origins of violence and aggression. You know, is it in our genes? Is it in our culture? And so forth. So he he definitely presented evidence for the evolutionary origins of violence and aggression. Catching Fire was trying to answer the question of why our brains got so big, and his thesis, which is held up pretty well, uh, is that cooking food changes the energy quality of food, enabling us to fuel these massive brains we have that are uh, many times larger than, well, several, quite a bit larger than the other primates. It takes a lot of fuel to run them. And so his third book, The Goodness Paradox, then kind of builds on that, showing that in addition to the evolutionary origins of violence and aggression, something else has happened. We've domesticated ourselves somehow. And so the paradox is that we're more like chimpanzees between groups of violence and more like bonobos within groups, and that we have two kinds of aggression, proactive and reactive. When you put these two kinds of aggression on spectrums, it really ends up explaining a lot of human behavior. So we talk about that. We talk about the evolutionary logic of aggression and why aggression would have evolved in the first place, the neural pathways of aggression, what's happening in the brain in proactive and reactive aggression. We talk about Adrian Raine's research, scanning the brains of um, uh, murderers um, and the difference between their prefrontal cortex versus their limbic systems and amygdalas. Uh, We talk about Belyev's famous silver fox domestication experiment in Russia, which is one of the most interesting I've I've ever read about and written about, Um, and what that tells us about the domestication process and how that alters, due to something called pleiotropy, uh, other characteristics like curly tails and floppy ears and white patches and so on. But in our case, smaller jaw, smaller teeth, lower levels of reactive aggression and so on. So he explains how the process of self-domestication can happen. We talk about Darwin's research in The Origin of Species and artificial versus natural selection and how a species can self-select or self-domesticate without a selector. Um, We talk about the tyrant problem, bullies, psychopaths, and what our ancestors in the Paleolithic would have done about them because we have some research on that. And then we pull back and, and we look at uh, bigger issues involving war and human nature. It's a great conversation. Please enjoy it. I give you Richard Rangham. Okay. Longtime I, fan. You're at, uh, you look like you're in your office at Harvard or at home? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yep. Okay. Yes, right. Well, 
Nice. Welcome to the Science Salon Podcast. Thanks for coming on. Congratulations on the new book, The Goodness Paradox, The Strange Relationship Between Virtue and Violence in Human Evolution. I read it uh, via audio. Okay. Uh, the unabridged audio reading, which is becoming very popular for uh, books now. Audio books are becoming uh, pretty, pretty big. So it's a great way to uh, consume content when you're driving around or cycling or hiking or vacuuming or whatever. Yes. So I haven't heard it. Uh, is there a good reader? Uh, yeah, the reader's good. Uh huh. Very clear. And uh, I, I always listen to books at 1.25 speed, so I can get through them a little faster and without much oh. distortion. Yeah, so that's okay. pretty good. Yeah. But I have to tell you a funny story. I started in on the book, and I'm, and I'm thinking, boy, this sounds so familiar. Uh, it's, it's almost like something I've written about. And then I remember, wait a minute, I think I did write something about this in uh, The Science of Good and Evil. So I go back to look at that book, which was 2003. And there I am talking about this very thing, citing you. <laughs> so here's, okay. so here's so what you, I... You know, uh, so you must have got that off from a, a video interview that John Brockman did with me. Well, well, this was based more on your um, uh, your earlier book, the the uh, demonic males. Oh, okay. Uh, the, so I was yes. writing about uh, this section was called the domesticated primate, and I make the distinction between uh, bonobos and chimps, and uh, and then I, I ask, what are we to make of this contrast between humans as within group bonobos, and humans as between group chimpanzees? Anthropologist Richard Rangham proffers a plausible theory that as a result of selection pressures for greater within-group peacefulness, humans and bonobos have gone down a different behavioral evolutionary path than chimpanzees. That difference may be witnessed in morphology. The pygmy chimpanzee moniker was given to bonobos because, compared to chimpanzees, their skull, jaws, and teeth are much reduced in size, even while the rest of their body parts remain quite similar. In domesticated animals, it has been observed that one of the most striking features in artificially selecting for docility among wild animals is that along with far less aggression, you also get a suite of other changes, including and especially a reduction in skull, jaw, jaw and teeth size. In genetics, this is called pleiotropy, pleiotropy, and then I go on talking about that and then conclude that section. Rangham suggests that over the past 20,000 years, as humans became more sedentary, and their populations grew. There was selection pressures for less within-group aggression, and this effect can be seen in the reduced size of our skulls, jaws, and teeth compared to our immediate hominid ancestors. Our year-round breeding season and more bonobo-like prodigious sexuality and our pedomorphism. Rangham also cites research that shows how area 13 in the limbic frontal cortex in humans believed to mediate the inhibition of aggressive behavior more closely resembles in size the equivalent area in bonobo brains than it does in chimpanzee brains. So then I went off to write about other things, and now I see you have a whole book in which you've ex essentially picked up where you left off in your 1997 book and developed that thesis that we're a domesticated primate in a way. Yes, I mean, but just to be precise about it, most of those ideas that you just cited so nicely in your book um, – I think they did come from, uh, not most of them came not from the uh, Demonic Males book, but from um, an interview that I gave with John Brockman that he published on the Edge yeah, website. You're right. That's right. You know what? I did see that. Uh, and, and so, you know, I feel embarrassed about that because, <laughs> you know, as scientists, we're not supposed to um, put things out into the public arena without proper citation and so on. You know, so I'm really catching up and, and uh, sort of making up for uh, that premature. Um, well, you know, Bro Brockman, has, Brockman has a way of doing that as a as a way to generate future book uh, projects, which this exactly. this has right. actually turned out to be. So that was that must have been fifteen years ago, maybe even more. It that, was a long time because what had happened is that uh, I submitted a book for publication, which um, had too much in it, and um, I guess it was the editor uh, at. Um, at Houghton Mifflin, I think at that time, Harry Foster, who said, uh, this book needs to be divided into two. And I divided it into two. And the first part was Catching Fire, mm. um, which was all about the uh, evidence for the, that the control of fire was very significant in human evolution. And the second part was uh, was the one that I just published. 
Very nice. So, uh, well, now this, so this is the third of your trilogy, let's say. <laughs> Something like that, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, uh, I forgot about that. You did that book. I read that book, The Catching Fire. Um, the evidence still supports your your thesis there that, that it was really cooking that um, led to bigger brains and that sort of thing. Has that held up pretty well? Um, I would say that it that it's certainly still debated. You know, you, lots of people who are, um, are still unhappy with it. But uh, at the time that I published, the evidence for the control of fire was clearly not in sync with what I was suggesting. You know, this was a prediction um, because I was saying that control of fire looks as it should have come in about 1.9 million years ago. And um, the archaeological evidence at that time, I think most people would have said uh, something like a quarter of a million years ago is where you go back to. So a big distance. But since then, there have been um, uh, quite a few publications pushing the control of fire further back. And so uh, now you've got uh, abundant evidence at uh, 400,000. Uh, you've got uh, very nice evidence at uh, 790,000 in Israel, uh, the site of Geshe Benet Yaakov. Uh, you've got um, uh, evidence that convinces, I would say, 90-something percent of the people. At Van der Werk in South Africa, uh, we're 30 meters deep in a cave. You've got fire that it's very difficult to see how it could have got there except by humans. Uh, you've got another site at um, about that same age in uh, Spain, Cueva Negra. And then there's just been published a reanalysis of uh, some of the fire evidence from Kubifora mm. in, uh, in uh, northern Kenya uh, by Sarah Lubick, uh, where uh, her analyses uh, make a very strong case for the control of fire at um, something like 1.6 million years ago. Oh, close. So what I'm seeing is it, it, the thing is just being pushed back, and it's slower than I would have hoped, but... Um, uh, but I, I believe that uh, the evidence is looking um, you know, increasingly robust. Uh, so the problem, the problem you were trying to explain with that book is how we got such big brains, so much larger than the other primates. That, that's certainly that's, that's a major issue. That's right. And, and one of the things that has happened since that book was published is that uh, calculations have been done on uh, the rate of energy use by neurons. Uh, this is by Susanna Herculano Husel. Uh, who wrote a book called The Human Advantage, and she concluded there was only one way that uh, humans could have got their big brains, and it's the same way that, that I had previously said, and that is uh, that you had to cook your food. And the basic story there is that, um, well, there are, there are two things. You know, One is that you simply uh, need the amount of extra energy that cooking provides, but the other thing is time, that um, if if humans were fueling our big brains purely on the basis of raw food, the estimate is that we would have to be eating for chewing for something like eight hours a day. And it just, you know, the math doesn't, doesn't work out. Be like a, like a cow just chewing all day. So it's, That's it, right. it's yeah, really course, meat, but it's meat, not just food. It's meat, especially, right? Um, Cooked it's, meat. Well, it's, it's not necessarily cooked meat, particularly it's, it's anything that's cooked. Um, I mean, a lot of cooked tubers, <laughs> You know, it's clear that and humans in uh, particularly in tropical areas cannot survive on uh, very high uh, meat diets. Uh, the reason is that if we have too much protein in our diets, uh, then we get basically urea poisoning because the consequences of urea of protein digestion is a production of urea. And there's a limit on how much we can get rid of. If you are a cat, you can get rid of a lot of it. You can have 100% uh, protein diet. Uh, if you're a human, it's more like about uh, 35%, maybe 40%, that sort of mm. thing. Um, but it is nowhere near 60%, 70%. So you have to make up the rest with, with fat or carbohydrate. Mm. And if you're an Eskimo, uh, then you can make it up with fat. There's lots of blubber. But there's nothing like that in in Africa. Uh, and uh, so, you, you know, none of the animals have got that much fat in them. Right. So you have to turn to uh, the tubers and um, uh, other plant foods. And, and they take a lot of chewing. I like these trendy diets people are on now, like the paleo diet, where we're going to eat like our paleolithic ancestors, which was what? Blubber or meat or tubers or, you know, pretty much a seafood diet. You, what you see, you eat. 
Yeah. Um, and uh, by the way, you know, I, I'm amused by that because some of the paleo diet books uh, talk about the, the need to eat raw as well. Oh, right. And, Which is uh, the, uh, but right. on the other hand, the recipes that they put in the back of the book are not for raw uh, <laughs> meat and so on. Uh, right. Uh, so the, the title of the new book is The Goodness Paradox. What's the paradox that you're trying to answer here? The paradox is that if you think, as uh, we sort of classically have been brought up to do, that aggression lies on a single scale from rather unaggressive to very aggressive, then humans are difficult to place because we are paradoxically either uh, if through one lens, uh, very unaggressive, and through another lens, very aggressive. So we're very unaggressive in the sense that uh, unlike most animals, you can put a herd of strangers together uh, in a big crowd and uh, fights do not break out. Uh, we're all very tolerant and graceful and, uh, and pleasant to each other. And yet, on the other hand, uh, we are very highly aggressive in the sense that if you just tot up the number of people who are killed in intergroup aggression in wars, you do this across different societies, any one period of a few decades, you find lots of variation among societies. But nevertheless, overall, uh, the, the rate of killing is very high compared to almost uh, any other species. It's not quite as high as wolves. Uh, it's about the same as it is in chimpanzees. Uh, so it's not completely exceptional. But nevertheless, it makes us into a very aggressive animal. The fact that uh, it doesn't matter what kind of society you go to, uh, you find that uh, there is this persistent risk that people are going to get killed by members of a neighboring society. And so on the one hand, we're very unaggressive. On the other hand, we're very highly aggressive. And somewhere we've got to resolve that paradox. Yeah, my friend Jared Diamond makes this uh, point about when he first went to Papua New Guinea birding uh, initially and then doing some anthropology there. And he's out on a single track hiking trail with his Papua New Guinea and native friends just doing birding and they encounter some complete stranger and his friends are like, let's get the hell out of here just in case they, they want to kill us. And Jared's like, no, let's shake their hand and, and see how they're doing. He's like, are you out of your mind? <laughs> in yeah, other words, yeah, it's so fascinating because we, we are now used to a society in which we're so connected to everybody that basically nobody is a stranger. Right. It's, it's only under very rare circumstances that you go somewhere where you can just not imagine any connections at all. And of course, you know, if you do do that, then you start to feel nervous. You know, whether you're on a re remote <clears> island <throat> somewhere or uh, uh, in an inner city or uh, in a country where uh, you just don't speak the language at all, uh, then, you know, those ancient human fears come cropping up. Yeah, well, the voyages of, of James Cook and others that were killed by natives, Cook himself was killed in Hawaii, um, you know, so it brings up these these kind of big, deep questions. You know, are we by nature violent or are we by nature peaceful? It's the wrong way to con con contrive of it. I think the way you do it is it's more of a spectrum and it's very context dependent. Uh, for example, you talk about two types of aggression, these proactive and reactive aggression. Uh, yet let, let's let's hover on that for a moment. So make the distinction between those two types. So um, this is a distinction that's been made for uh, uh, several decades in biology and psychology, and uh, it applies to um, uh, contexts that vary from uh, immediate reaction to a threat, uh, and that's reactive aggression, to uh, carefully planned and premeditated deliberate action uh, to, to hurt somebody. Um, I've got someone knocking at my door. Excuse me. Uh, yeah, sure. I... Go ahead. Yeah, we'll, we'll pause it for a second. <clears throat> Hello. Oh, hi. I'm sorry. I know you have a meeting now. That's Do true. Do you have any time today? Uh, in a couple of hours. Couple means two? Two. two. Okay. <laughs> see you. Try to see you. Good, great. Okay, uh, so uh, I'll tell my sound engineer, okay, Alexander, we'll pick it up there again. So okay. you're talking about, in the book, two types of aggression, proactive and reactive aggression. What are those two different types? Reactive aggression is the type that on a day-to-day -day basis we're more familiar with. Uh, it is basically losing your temper or something a little bit less than that. It always Im involves emotional arousal. It's uh, the kind of the fight-or-flight uh, response. 
uh, where uh, you are threatened. Maybe you're threatened because uh, somebody is impugning your status, uh, uh, someone is insulting your mother, uh, someone is trying to, to take a piece of a drink away from you, um, and, uh, and you just feel aroused and you want to do something about it. And so it tends to be uh, somewhat low level, although it can be responsible for murders, of course. So if you find your wife in bed with another man, uh, then that's reactive aggression when you pull out your gun and immediately uh, shoot one or both of them. Um, so that's reactive aggression. It's um, uh, related to testosterone. It's related to alcohol. Um, it's, uh, it's that sudden flare up. Proactive aggression is uh, the calm, deliberate uh, response of uh, somebody who wants to achieve a goal and uses aggression to do it. They may, need not be uh, aroused at the time. And the, the classic example of this in humans is war, where uh, it doesn't really matter if you are in a small scale society and a group of men plotting around a campfire to go off and spend two or three days uh, running towards the neighbors and plunking a spear into some unfortunate individual and then running back again. Or on the other hand, uh, you are a, a war council in uh, a contemporary industrial nation, uh, which is planning a bombing raid. The essential psychology is the same. Uh, we want to go and kill somebody in the neighboring group. That's proactive aggression. So I could see a context where it could be both. For example, the burglar wants to burgle your home when you're not there because he just wants your stuff and doesn't want to encounter you. But then you surprise him. So that would be proactive. But then you surprise him. You come home early. There's a fight and he pulls a gun and kills you reactively. Uh, that, so that would be an example of both at work. Yes. And um, there are all sorts of ways in which these two uh, forms are linked. And uh, in the point that you're making is that proactive aggression, if it leads to the victim fighting back, then it engages reactive aggression in the originally proactive aggressor. Right. So, so one might say, <clears throat> well, you know, how useful is this distinction? But the reason that I think it's particularly useful is that we now know that in animals, uh, you can find models uh, in uh, rats and mice and cats that people have studied neurobiologically, and they are able to show that uh, proactive and reactive aggression are um, uh, they, they involve different parts of the brain. So they both involve the same essential attack circuit, but the neurons that are participating in eliciting proactive aggression are different neurons from the ones that are used in reactive aggression. Is that the rage circuit that we hear about with reactive aggression, like in cats? Uh, yes, right. I mean, so... Um, a particularly prominent circuit that has been looked at um, is uh, that involving uh, the amygdala, uh, the hypothalamus, and the periaqueductal gray uh, at the uh, uh, near the base of the brainstem, uh, which is involved in actually getting the muscles uh, going off and doing things. And uh, so you find that, uh, for instance, uh, it's the dorsal part of the periaqueductal gray that is involved in reactive aggression, and it's the ventral part that's involved in proactive aggression. Mm. So once you see that the neurobiology is different, then you recognize that uh, these can be subject to uh, different evolutionary pathways, which explains why when teachers uh, are asked to assess uh, children according to um, criteria of whether or not they're proactive or reactive aggressors, you know, put them on a scale. Um, the proactive ones are the ones who um, uh, who bully others uh, without any immediate provocation. The reactive ones are the ones that react um, uh, excessively to uh, the mild slight, that sort of thing. And when you do that, what you find is that some kids are very high on both measures, but some kids will only be high on one of them. Some might be a, a bully that doesn't react easily. Some, some might be someone who's very reactive but is not, not a bully. And then there are others who are very low on both. So, you know, we see that there is, although there's some association, there's also some separation. And that's at a pretty young age, right? So that, that would imply a genetic component. Yes. Uh, I mean, I suppose you could argue that there will be environmental impacts even up to that point. But uh, genetic analyses have been done using twin studies. And again, they show the same thing, which is that 
there is an association uh, uh, between proactive and reactive aggression, but it is also uh, separate according to the uh, the studies of twins who have been reared apart. So that you get you know, some where there's high reactive and low proactive and, and, and vice versa. Probably pretty much like uh, any other behavioral trait, 50 to 60% of the variance will be accounted for by genetics. When you look at things like twin studies and the big five personality temperaments and and all that, it yes. just has to be kind of in that category or in that exactly. range, I would suspect. I was thinking about context dependency on these types of aggression in Richard Nisbet's research on the Southern culture of honor and how students from Southern uh, states are different from students in Northern states. For our listeners, I'll set up the context. He's uh, set up this experiment in a, in a room where there's a narrow hallway and the students' subjects have to fill out a form and then they have to walk it down this narrow hallway to turn it into some other. Of course, that's all a phony setup. And, you know, working away at a filing cabinet is somebody who's, that, that the, the subject has to kind of narrowly uh, walk around and the, and, and the stooge bumps him and says something like, asshole. And so he's interested in the reaction of the subjects to being called an asshole and bumped. And the students from Southern uh, states were more likely to react pretty spontaneously, a little more aggressively. I think they, t- I think he drew blood, and, and there were higher levels of of stress hormones and things like that. Testosterone, yes, right. So that right. would imply, I mean, this idea <laughs> well, that there's you know difference between southern and northern uh, cultures of honor versus uh, you know whatever whatever the other culture would be in how you, I guess, regulate your reactive aggression. Yes. Um, I mean, I think the, uh, the general idea is that uh, testosterone uh, acts as um, a kind of suppressor of the ability of the prefrontal cortex to regulate your emotions. So it's a little bit like alcohol. And this is the idea that uh, Justin Le Carre has, has produced recently, and it seems very reasonable that it's basically interfering with your control ability. And, and if those um, you know, lovely culture of honor experiments of, of Dick Nisbet and, and Cohen um, are, are correct, you know, and it'd be nice to see, given, given the replication crisis in psychology, <laughs> yes, it'd be know, nice to I see know. them replicated. Yes. And, you know, they're difficult ones to do and the yeah. sample size was small. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, one, one can easily imagine that there are cultural reasons why uh, individuals have, uh, in the end, uh, slightly higher testosterone levels. Um, I mean, these vary, of course, from day to day and hour to hour uh, in some areas and others. And, and it would certainly be expected to affect your, your propensity for reactive aggression. So it's not as if these uh, genetic differences uh, and evolved differences are the whole story. They're not right. at all, of course. Right. You know, there will always be strong environmental influences as well. Yeah, I was thinking about this with this idea of... Um you know, control of the reactive aggression, it, it almost implies that there's these urges bubbling up from the brainstem or wherever that the prefrontal cortex, you know, kind of keeps a lid on. Uh, I think Franz Duvall calls this the vin- thin veneer theory of morality, that it, he, the way he interprets Dawkins' theory of the selfish gene and so on is that we are this sort of violent species and we're on the verge of erupting at any moment, but civilization keeps this thin veneer just kind of keeping the lid on it. So he, I think he mischaracterizes Dawkins' theory there or the whole genre, but, but that it, it's his counter to that, which I also think is right. It's not, that's too simple. <laughs> uh, in any case that we have this good side of our behavior and nature and this dark side, we have better angels and inner demons as Steve Pinker puts it. Um, that it's it's really quite a mix, and it has to do with kind of the evolutionary logic of why we have those emotions in the first place. Yeah, I mean, um, the, you know, the the idea that um, I th- that I think Duval is trying to address uh, there is that the way in which uh, or the degree to which humans are able to control their emotions is is a result of um, I lived experience uh, of uh, the environment in which you're brought up. Uh, you, you learn certain moral codes, and uh, and you are able to control yourself. 
Uh, you know, I think the difficulty with uh, the kind of approach that uh, that Franz Duval has taken in that respect is that that he did not appreciate uh, specifically this division between reactive and proactive aggression. It makes everything so much simpler because uh, instead of having one scale of aggression where you have to work out where we are and then see why sometimes we don't behave in the way that expected by you know, being, say, unaggressive, why are we suddenly aggressive or vice versa. Instead, there are two scales of aggression. Doubtless, if you were you know, in 300 years time, we'll have, we'll have a more sophisticated version again. But um, if we can just stick to two scales of aggression to start with, I think it's a, it's a huge advance. And what it is, is where are we on the scale of reactive aggression? Well, the comparison I've been making is with chimpanzees. Compared to chimpanzees, we are definitely on the very low end of the reactive aggression scale. I say that because we have totted up the frequency with which humans fight compared to the frequency with which chimpanzees fight. And we don't know exactly what proportion of these fights are reactive and proactively motivated, but we have a pretty good idea. And I think there's a very strong case for saying that uh, humans or chimpanzees are fighting something like a thousand times more frequently per hour in a you know, regular day-to-day -day encounters uh, than um, humans are. Yeah, it was striking, striking in your book, the, the rates of um, abuse of females by males. You know, we, we you know, we're, we're concerned about this if it happens, you know, once in, in a lifetime of a female or once a month for a battered spouse or something like this. I think you said it happens like every day or every hour in somebody's it's incredibly community. Frequent. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it, it's, it's easy to talk about humans as being relatively unaggressive <laughs> uh, and and therefore sort of imply somehow that the uh, domestic abuse uh, isn't very important. You know, so I want to make sure that people don't misinterpret me in that respect. You know, it's clear that that the frequency of male to female violence is unpleasantly high compared to the standards that we would like to have. But it still is very low compared to chimpanzees, as you were just drawing out. Right. Uh, you know, you had this terrible ritual almost where uh, as a male chimpanzee gets to the age of about nine or ten, then they start their rise towards the male dominance hierarchy. And the way they achieve their um, entry into the male hierarchy is, first of all, by physically defeating every female. So what he does, about the same time as he's beginning to get about the same body weight as an adult female, uh, he starts teasing the female to the point where she has to slap him and then he slaps back. That's mm. basically what happens. And he, they get into a fight, and the first few times he's likely to lose. And then he starts winning. And then he takes advantage of that and just beats her up on a regular basis. Mm. And he does that to every single female in the group. And so, you know, compared to humans, you realize that this is an extremely violent society. Mm -hmm. So that's reactive aggression. We're very low on it compared to chimps. Well, what about proactive aggression? Well, there are, you know, I mentioned already that the, the frequency with which uh, a chimpanzee or a human are killed by members of their own species in intergroup aggression is roughly the same order of magnitude. It's, um, you know, say, say it's uh, something around 1% of the uh, population are going to be killed in that way. So this is you know, high compared to other animals. Mm -hmm. And uh, it means that uh, we are on the high end of the proactive aggression scale. So we're low in one way and we're high in another. And now we've got two separate problems to think about. Right. Why are we low on that scale and why are we high on the other one? And that's when your domestication thesis comes in. But before we get to that, you know, most people think of aggression as something that's just bad and wrong and immoral and we have to breed it out or, or civilize it out of, uh, out of our nature. But I think... I think there's an evolutionary logic to it. Here's how I described it in the moral arc, um, starting with Dawkins. You know, if you were a gene, what would you do to continue into the future? A cell or body or organism, a survival machine, is the gene's way of surviving and perpetuating itself. 
The problem is that survival machines scurrying around in, say, a liquid environment like an ocean or pond will bump into other survival machines, all of whom are competing for the same limited resources. Now, quoting Dawkins, to a survival machine, another survival machine, which is not its own child or another close relative, is part of its environment, like a rock or a river or a lump of food. But there's a difference between a survival machine and a rock. A survival machine is inclined to hit back if exploited. This is because it too is a machine that holds its immortal genes and trust for the future, and it too will stop at nothing to preserve them. Thus, Dawkins concludes, natural selection favors genes that control their survival machines in such a way that they make the best use of their environment. This includes making the best use of other survival machines, both of the same and different species. So on the one hand, we can we can develop moral emotions and be nice to our other survival machines as a way of perpe- perpetuating our genes. On the other hand, uh, if they try to exploit us, then we have to develop a reputation of fighting back. And so certain forms of aggression are logical, that if you don't aggress back to bullies and exploiters, you will be you'll be eliminated from the gene pool. Yes, and and um, of course, you know, in different species, uh, depending on your uh, evolutionary ecology, depending on the way uh, you make a living, uh, then it may be better not to uh, to try and fight back. It may be better just to to give up uh, straight away. In other words, selection can favour non aggressiveness, and it depends on the species, uh, it depends on the sex, it depends on the age, and so on. Uh, this this kind of issue about the what aggression means in terms of its evolutionary value, I often think about when I see discussions of human aggression, because the standard way in which people think about human aggression is that it is uh, something that reflects uh, something going wrong with uh, the individual. You know, they, and of course, from the point of view of society, we don't like aggressiveness. But from the point of view of the individual, there may well be a, a strong evolutionary rationale uh, why an individual is not merely willing to stand up for themselves if uh, somebody pushes them about, but uh, why they might be a psychopath. You know, it's it's a daunting thought that psychopathy, uh, in its various forms, um, might have been under positive selection in humans. Another possibility is that our ancestors were much more psychopathic than. Uh, we are now, and that the 2% or whatever it is that uh, is represented nowadays by psychopathy uh, is the dwindling end of, uh, of, a, of a particular evolutionary direction. But either way, uh, the reason that we have psychopaths in our population is probably not because uh, they are all the products of something going wrong in the genome, but because in our evolutionary past, that kind of behavior was favored. Right. So there is an evolutionary logic to it. I think the, I think natural selection could not eliminate every last psychopath. I think it's it's too big a job, and societies can function fairly well if only one to two percent are psychopathic bullies. And and as you point out, well, we'll get into the execution thesis. You know that 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 was a, a good winnowing process, but you can't execute every last bully. Uh, it would just take too much resources from society. So, you know, we tolerate a little bit of it. Yeah, there, there may be, but uh, but there's no reason uh, to think that under the appropriate selection pressures, you can't uh, have a selective sweep that uh, totally eliminates uh, or you know, reduces to way less than 1% uh, something that is, is, is disadvantageous. Um, yeah, I well, mean, in, mo- in modern society, we just shuffle them off to Wall Street and they run corporations or they run for political office. Well, that's the trouble. <laughs> that they actually have some success and, and that <laughs> really right. creates problems. <laughs> right. Well, let's talk about your idea, your theory here of self-domestication. I want to come at that through um, Darwin's great book, The Origin of Species. What always bothered me about the opening of that book, because I have to deal with creationists, is he starts off his first chapter talking about artificial selection in uh, bred animals like pigeons, for example, and then makes the analogy natural selection is a little bit like artificial selection. What always bothered me about that is that 
artificial selection is definitely top down directed from an intelligent agent called humans and of course creation is li- like that uh, analogy <laughs> and uh but on the other hand he is saying that no no it's this it's this bottom up process that happens and that's harder intuitively to grasp how that can happen you know naturally from the bottom up without anybody giving it direction and, and in a way that's what you're attempting to do here and it is counterintuitive you know, we understand completely domesticating animals, and you have a whole section on on the, the silver foxes experiment, which which we'll get to because it's super fascinating. But how can that happen naturally without anybody directing it? That's well, the I mean, it's a great question uh, in the context of Darwin, of course, because uh, as you probably know, uh, Darwin actually contemplated the possibility that that humans have undergone some kind of domestication-like process. The reason he did so is because in many ways human behavior is like that of a domesticated animal and there are some other features of our biology that are somewhat like domesticates. So Darwin said to himself, uh, is it possible that humans have been domesticated? And he, um, he tried to find evidence from the past of people who had actually made deliberate efforts to domesticate humans. Now at this point I think he was going off in the wrong direction. but. Uh, you know, he he cites uh, uh, Friedrich uh, William the First of Prussia, who tried to domesticate. Uh, when he, he didn't try to domesticate. He tried to select for particular characteristics uh, in his army. He wanted really tall men. He tried to breed them with tall women in order to get generations uh, in his Potsdam <laughs> regiment uh, of uh, immense people who would win fights uh, all over Europe, and. He didn't succeed because there was tremendous resentment about being bred together for Mm. uh, the king's purpose. And Darwin took that as one of his pieces of evidence that humans had not been domesticated. Mm. In other words, Darwin himself made the mistake or the so got into the intellectual bind that you're describing of thinking that you had to have a domesticator to produce a, a domesticated version of humans. And um, nowadays, I think that both in the case of domesticated animals quite commonly and in the case of humans, uh, uh, many of us are thinking that you don't need a top-down domesticator to do it. Many people now think that the way in which dogs evolved from wolves was that they self-domesticated. Why would they self-domesticate? The notion is that as people started living in permanent settlements, they produced a new resource for the wolves to be able to exploit. The resource was the garbage and the uh, the feces uh, of the people living in the, the village. The wolves that were least fearful and, and least aggressive in approaching humans were the ones that were able to get access to this new resource and feed well. And you'd need to have some kind of separation between those wolves and the wolves in the population that was not visiting the villages. Somehow that would have been achieved. And the the wolves then were on the way to becoming dogs without any active interference from humans. They were self-domesticating because those puppies that were the tamest from the point of view of being willing to run forwards and steal food from the edge of the village would be the ones that grew up fastest, had the best immune systems to respond to diseases, and had the most babies because they were having more food. So that concept of self-domestication is now uh, one that is uh, applicable to um, possibly various domesticated species and to uh, other species that have not been associated with humans at all. So the prime example in my mind there is the bonobo compared to the chimpanzee. And then the third type of species is is humans, where uh, humans have their own logic for uh, having evolved from a more aggressive ancestor in the sense of the ancestor having a higher rate of reactive aggression. Because in all of these cases of domestication, that's the kind of aggression that is particularly in play. It's the um, emotionally aroused form of aggression, 
where you are responding to an immediate threat. So just on uh, time frame comparisons, wolves self-domesticating in about 15 to 20,000 years? Yeah. And the last common ancestor of humans, chimps and bonobos, is what, six to seven million years? Yes. So plenty of time. Uh, well, yes. Uh, now, um, so with uh, chimps and bonobos, uh, they themselves separated from each other. It's still not really well known, but, but uh, between one and two million years ago, that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, so that, that leaves plenty of time, and a, a large number of generations, uh, which is the, the, the critical variable. And, of course, we have no fossil record of those species. So what we don't know is how quickly a chimpanzee-like ancestor became a bonobo. It could have happened in the first, uh, you know, 100,000 years. Uh, it might have taken much longer. One of the remarkable questions is why it is that bonobos should still show signs of having been domesticated in its skeleton, mm. uh, its skull and its skeleton, because um, one of the consequences of domestication is that you get many unselected traits coming along at the same time as being as you're selecting against the aggression. And what is a very peculiar thing is that you would expect that those unselected traits should uh, eventually become um, reversed back to the original adaptive state. Mm. So, you know, to be specific about it, uh, Bonobo has got uh, a short face, small teeth, and small brain compared to a chimpanzee. Well, uh, if it's had those for a million years, wouldn't you think that by now selection would say, okay, well, let's get you back to a bigger brain, or let's get you back to you know, the larger teeth and, and, uh, and bigger face to enable you to, to chew all the appropriate foods? So, so that, that's kind of a mystery, you know, mm. why it is that these consequences of domestication can last such a very long time. Uh, uh, parenthetically, uh, you're probably familiar with Brian Hare's work with uh, dogs and their ability to read the minds, theory of mind, of, of humans better than chimps in his famous experiment where he, the dog is uh, out of view of where the food is. He puts food under a a cup here and the other cup may be empty or whatever. And he points to the one where the food is. The dog knows that's where the food is. The chip can't read that. And so that's only 15,000 years of domestication and learning to read human cues. That's pretty fast on an evolutionary time scale. Yes, it is. Um, and uh, I, of course, you know, I, I know Brian's work well because he was my student. And, oh, I didn't uh, know that. Okay. Yes. Oh, very yes, good. Yes, right. right. So what happened with that experiment uh, <laughs> is that, that he... I uh, was working uh, on that and um, produced that lovely result. And um, initially what he said was, uh, it looks like humans have been selecting for uh, the ability of dogs to read uh, human signals, so he's selecting for social cognition. And I said, uh, that is indeed one possibility. But there is another possibility as well. And that is that this is an incidental consequence of selection against reactive aggression. Oh, right. Uh, and so uh, uh, Brian agreed, and we decided that the way to, to distinguish between these two ideas was to find an animal that had been selected against reactive aggression, but not for any kind of reading of human signals. Mm. And the, this was, uh, the, there was a, a perfect species waiting for us, and that is the silver fox, studied by Dmitry Belyev and uh, Ludmilla Trut and their colleagues uh, in Novozabirsk in Siberia since 1958. <laughs> because what's happened with that experiment is that uh, there has been a very deliberate selection for uh, breeding by uh, those who, when they were kits, the pup puppies, as it were, uh, were most tolerant of being stroked and approached by humans, uh, but not for any kind of ability to read human signals. So Brian, um, in his graduate career, uh, suddenly shot off to Novozibirsk. Uh, he went with uh, an undergraduate, Natalie Ignacio, and the two of them did these wonderful experiments. And it was they were tricky to do because 
the foxes were basically um, rather unwilling to uh, to watch uh, humans, but he, uh, they devised a system uh, for uh, seeing how willing they were to pay attention to human signals involving uh, the production of a feather. And, and lo and behold, uh, what they found was that uh, if uh, you looked at the domesticated line, then they could read human signals. Whereas if you looked at the, the line that had not been selected, then uh, they were unable to read the human signals. Oh. So this really seemed to show that what was happening in the um, production of the signals that, uh, or what's, what's happening when dogs read human signals better than wolves do, is that they're able to do so because of selection against aggression and not because they've been deliberately chosen to be the breeders who are good at reading human signals. And it kind of makes sense because if you're aggressive and fearful, then you're not paying attention to, you know, these sort of interesting potential sources of information, like people pointing at things. Instead, you're looking at to see whether or not someone's going to chase you. <laughs> Very good. That's such a great story of hypothesis testing and teasing apart influencing variables and, and uh, putting it to the test. Um, let's let's uh, bore into that um, silver fox experiment a little bit more because it's so interesting. And explain what pleiotropy means, why it is that if you breed for do do docility, you're going to get all these other weird things like curly tails and a white splotch on the forehead and smaller jaws. What, why would that happen? Well, so so first of all, you know, what does happen, and, and you kind of just gave the the story, um, you know, <clears throat> starting in 1958, uh, uh, the Belief experiment uh, showed that if you select purely on uh, the reactive uh, emotions of uh, these foxes, then uh, not only do you rapidly get a, a kind of fox that is um, got much less fear, much less likelihood of aggression, uh, much uh, lower levels of stress. So all the things you're selecting for happen. But in addition, you get things like you mentioned, the, uh, the white spots uh, on the forehead or the, the white uh, ends to the, the legs and the tail, white patches in, in various places. Uh, you get curly tails. Uh, uh, you get a change in the hair. You get um, uh, uh, changes in vocalizations. Um, uh, you, you get a, a bunch of stuff happening. And your question was why? Because uh, not only does it happen in the foxes, but of course, as Darwin pointed out, in all domesticated animals, uh, you get these same sorts of changes. I mean, or a classic example is the floppy ear. So uh, Darwin claimed, I'm not sure he's really right, but he claimed that every species of domesticated animal or mammal um, has some individuals with floppy ears. Uh, cat owners might challenge that. Uh, <laughs> There is a floppy-eared cat that, that seems unrelated to this particular propensity. But anyway, you know, floppy ears are very common. And guess what happened with the silver foxes? Within a few generations, individuals were turning up with floppy ears. Uh, and in the wild, uh, how many floppy-eared animals are there? Very, very few. Uh, Darwin pointed only to one kind, and that is the elephant. Mm. So... The phenomenon is that you associate domestication, in other words, the reduction of reactive aggression, with a whole series of things like floppy ears and white patches that have got absolutely nothing to do with the aggression, apparently. And your question is why? And that's, you know, that question is on, you know, it's very much uh, in the mode at the moment. Too. And there are a few ideas. The one that uh, I've been involved with testing um, is... Uh, the idea that uh, when you select for reduced aggressiveness or reduced fear, then what you're essentially doing is uh, looking for individuals whose pattern of neural crest cell migration is different from the original. Neural crest cell migration is what happens to this very odd tissue called neural crest uh, starting uh, shortly after gastrulation. It's shortly after you have first got sort of something approaching the, the notion of a body uh, in the growing embryo. 
about three weeks after conception in the case of humans. And the neural crest is a, a, this tissue that lies along the back, the dorsal part of the uh, growing embryo. And uh, it emerges and then spreads out around the embryo. And as it spreads and moves, uh, it changes into uh, different kinds of cells. And it has impacts on many, many different tissues in the body. Um, one of them is that uh, the adrenals are derived from neural crest cells. And if you have uh, fewer neural crest cells arriving uh, in the place where the adrenals are going to come, then the adrenals are going to end up being smaller, literally. And that's going to mean that you're going to just produce less cortisol. And that's a feature that is regularly associated with domesticated animals. And the basic idea is that uh, when you are selecting for reduced fear and aggression and stress, then uh, the changes to the neural crest are the easiest way to produce it, to producing these changes. And in the course of producing the reduced fear and aggression and stress, they also inevitably have other effects as well. And there's one lovely example that we know we understand quite well, and that is with the production of pigment. Uh, so one of the things that the neural crest cells do is, as they spread out, uh, they're going to become melanocytes, the, the cells that produce melanin and give color uh, to, uh, to the skin or the hair. Well, uh, the timing is critical here. If the neural crest cells move too slowly, then at the time that pigment production starts, then the cells have not quite reached the areas, and that le means that the areas where the uh, melanocytes have not reached are end up being white. And the way it happens is that the, the cells spread from the back, and they go out and then uh, down around the tummy, and they're also down the legs and down towards the end of the tail. So why do so many domesticated animals have the white tip to the tail or white socks on their feet? It's because the neural crest cells have been moving too slowly and haven't reached there at the time that melanin production starts. Uh, that's also why you have a white spot on your forehead. Uh, you know, the horse that's called Blaze um, has a white spot there because the neural crest cells have come round the face and then they're going to close up on the top and they don't quite get to the point where they've all closed up uh, in their sheet and they've, they've left a, a blank spot. So the neural crest cells for melanin are simply converting an all-white animal into whatever color it's going to be, and they just don't finish the job. Yes, exactly, right. Um, and, 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 basically, and the genes that code for that also code on the same chromosome or whatever when you're selecting for this docility. Is that a right way to say it? Yes, I think, I think that, that is. And it, this is a hypothesis. Um, it, um, you know, Adam Wilkins and Tecumseh Fitch and I wrote about this in uh, 2014. Uh, since then, there has been no absolutely killing evidence, but you have papers now written, uh, <coughs> such as a dog one, saying um, a comparison of dog and wolf uh, biology shows vital role for neural crest cells. So, you know, that's pretty good for the hypothesis. We've actually, I think there are now five different uh, species of mammals in which people have got evidence that the neural crest cell genes have been modified in domesticated animals compared to the, their wild ancestors. So and it's looking pretty good. And in the case of floppy ears, it's just the cartilage is not strengthened enough to hold it up? Yes, that if you have a longish ear, uh, then the cartilage is neural crest cell derived and uh, not enough uh, goes through to be able to, to keep the ear stiff. The whole pin are stiff. I wonder if in the case of elephants, the ear is just so huge, no cartilage could hold it up. That's true, although I love the idea that there might have been some <clears throat> self-domestication mm. in elephants. Mm. Um, but that's a you know, classic case where it's going to be very difficult to tell because we don't have the uh, appropriate ancestors to be able to compare with. You know, it's only going to be rare that you've, you've got that. Yeah. <clears throat> but the, you know, the, the big <clears throat> question with the neural crest cell hypothesis or any other is... Um, I think about the brain, because although you have uh, very important events associated with uh, the adrenals and the hypothalamic pituitary axis in general, uh, it seems to me that it's very likely that we're going to need an explanation that accounts for uh, the brain being 
tweaked in domesticated animals compared to wild animals in terms of the emotional response. And um, none of the brain is neural crest cell derived, mm. but the growth factors that promote the rate of growth of the brain are mm. neural crest cell derived. And we know from experiments with uh, chickens done by Nicole Ledoarang that uh, if you um, have fewer neural crest cells uh, sent towards the cranium, uh, then you end up with a smaller brain. Hmm. So, you know, th there's, it's going to be a fascinating uh, area to see this develop. And it may be there are other issues, other sort of aspects of biology that contribute to this domestication syndrome. But I feel pretty confident that the neural crest cell story is going to be a big part of it. Yeah, that part of your book was really interesting. I'd never heard anything like that. And you just articulated it perfectly. But I have a super simple question. In this docility process of domestication, is it that in reactive aggression, there, there's less emotion or aggression or hormones or whatever testosterone that's coming out? Or is it that the suppressing device, the governor from a higher part of the brain is suppressing it more or both? I don't think it's just the governing, uh, the re prefrontal cortex, you know, um, because uh, the the ability to regulate aggression is is a relatively sophisticated uh, cognitive ability. Um, you know, it's uh, it's something that we all uh, learn. Um, the, the, I think the evidence would be pointing pretty much directly towards uh, the the production of reactive aggression to a given stimulus. And the, the idea that I like is this, that um, the, uh, the propensity to respond to a confrontation with aggression varies in almost every species between adults and juveniles. Juveniles are basically much less likely to stand up for themselves if somebody says, don't do that. Uh, or I want your food or whatever. Uh, it's when you become an adult that you're much more likely to stand up and, and try and confront the other one and fight back. And the, it seems to me that the easiest target of selection, uh, when there is a selective advantage to being less aggressive in subsequent generations, you know, such as because a human is, is selecting you or because there's an ecological reason for it, the easiest target of selection is the rate at which emotional development occurs. You know, we all know from our high school experiences that some individuals enter puberty young and some enter puberty older. And this happens in other animals too. And the ones that would enter uh, puberty latest would be the ones who would be uh, shifting from the juvenile strategy of confrontation latest the ones who would be you know, more uh, willing to give up without a fight throughout puberty. Well, uh, that seems to me to be a way of starting to think about uh, how selection is going to be able to favor individuals with a reduced propensity for aggression because they might retain that juvenile pattern, the sort of more you know, the less aggressive pattern, uh, all the way through into adulthood. And this would explain why you end up with um, a smaller brain, which would be more juvenile brain, and why uh, the whole face uh, might look more juvenile than the uh, adults of the ancestor. You mean, say, comparing Homo sapiens to Neanderthals? Yes, exactly. Um, you know, so if you look at the the growth patterns of Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, then there are some differences that happen very early in life. But in addition, uh, you can look at, uh, I think um, Zollikoffer characterizes 15 stages of growth uh, in sapiens, and then there's a 16th uh, in Neanderthals, which just goes a bit beyond. Mm -hmm. Now, we didn't evolve from Neanderthals, but Neanderthals provide a pretty good model of the mid-Pleistocene ancestor that we did have. Now, to nuance that discussion on the engine versus the brake, um, you mentioned earlier alcohol is a, is a disinhibitory uh, mechanism, and young men in bars that have been drinking are, you know, well known to get into fights, as if the the violence is bubbling up underneath and there, but for the brake that goes off, yes, out it comes. Yeah, that that's true, right? Well, I mean, humans, of course, have got uh, 
a, a particularly large prefrontal cortex in relationship to uh, the size of the, the limbic system, uh, where the emotions, uh, in a sense, bubble up. Uh, so we, we, are, we are particularly good at controlling our emotions. But what you're arguing, I, I think, is that were it not for our self-domestication, you wouldn't even need the alcohol. The violence would just come out like crazy anyway. Yes, and that, that's my vision of our ancestors, uh, that um, uh, half a million years ago, uh, you know, th they, they didn't need the, the alcohol uh, right. to start a fight, right. which, you know, my guess is that's why they were, or a very important part of why they were living apparently in smaller groups. <laughs> as, as another related sidebar, uh, uh, I've often used this, these particular examples from Adrian Raine's book, uh, The Anatomy of Violence, where he talks about, well, there's three cases. There was the famous Charles Whitman case of the young man that went to the University of Texas, Austin, Bell Tower and shot up a bunch of people and left that note uh, that, uh, you know, he should do an autopsy on his brain because he felt like there was something wrong. Sure enough, he's got a a, a tumor in there. And and then, um, and then Mr. Oft, OFT, who was that patient that uh, was a apparently a pedophile. He was um, doing un, uh, uh, inappropriate things with his wife's uh, stepdaughter, with his stepdaughter from his wife. And it turns out he had a tumor in his brain. And you know, Adrian's point is, well, we don't think of them as pedophiles or serial killers. They're, they're, they're medical patients. They have a brain tumor, a problem in their brain and then and then he his third example is Dante Page a young African American male who killed this um college student raped and killed her and he's on death row and and Adrian apparently was on the defense team to to get him off of death row anyway not that he was innocent but that he had this horrific background so Adrian spends pages and pages talking about this background dropped on his head a bunch of times no father drugs gangs juvenile delinquency it just goes on and on i mean just you know the worst imaginable upbringing you could have. Now, there's no obvious tumor, like when you scan the brain, there's nothing obviously wrong with it other than he had the crappiest background you could possibly have. And obviously, yeah. this did something to his brain. Now, two things. One, that does kind of recontextualize it into, well, it's it's a medical problem, not, not, not a, you know, something else, a moral issue. But also, it sort of implies that if they didn't have the tumor, um, the, you know, the governor has taken off. But it, I never have thoughts like that, even if I'm drunk. I don't think about raping and killing people and so on. Um, so there, it's hard to say what the, the tumor is doing. Is it generating more proactive aggression? Is it removing the governor? Is it both? Maybe we don't know. Yeah, and, and I, I certainly don't know those cases well enough. Um, but... Um... I, but this does call to mind uh, Adrian Raine's generalization that he produced by a comparison of of accused murderers, where uh, he went into a prison uh, where people were um, uh, accused of various murders and were being held in jail. And uh, you could look at the particular cases, the murders, and decide whether or not uh, they had been the result of proactive violence or reactive violence. Mm. And uh, so he was able to categorize these very comfortably. And then uh, he did PET scans uh, to see the amount of uh, energy being um, sp used in uh, the brains of these individuals. So this wasn't associated with the particular murders. This is just, you know, what they were like uh, sitting around in prison. Uh, how much activity basically was there going on in the prefrontal cortex? And what he found was that the proactive murderers uh, had uh, exactly the amount of activity in their prefrontal cortex that uh, anyone else would expect to have, mm. just a, an average. But the reactive murderers had very low activity in their prefrontal cortex, which is a crude way of indicating that uh, the prefrontal cortex was less able to control the emotions, emotional stimuli coming from uh, deep inside the brain. So uh, he then... Um, yeah, but to my point, um, this implies that those thoughts are bubbling up in all of us, but were the governor not there to hold them back or keep them down, we would all act like this. And I don't think that's true. Or I'm not... It doesn't seem like that's true. That, that seems like it's pushing it a little too far. Like most people don't have pedophilic thoughts and feelings. Most, most don't. 
So it's not like you need it. Most of us need a governor to hold that back. Maybe that's not, maybe that's, maybe that's a different issue than reactive aggression though. Well, um, I mean, there's an issue, one of, one of the issues here is conscious versus unconscious. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, uh, there, there could be unconscious, uh, uh, thoughts that, uh, that, that you just don't know about, you know, <laughs> that, that, uh, if you were sufficiently drunk, uh, you might do things that uh, you would come to regret later and that you would say, well, that's not the real you because you never feel like that normally. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that, you know, they, the stimuli are there actually because, uh, because when you're less capable of controlling your, your stimuli, then you know, your behavior changes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it was in Christopher Browning's book, Ordinary Men, about the Einsatzgruppen that were killing Jews in Eastern Europe and the things they had to do to get themselves uh, to accommodate to this different lifestyle of just daily murders, one of which was just getting shit-faced every day. Uh, they just kind of had to, yeah. uh, before and after, whatever, and then also growing accustomed to it. You know, at first it's very, he, he re reprints these letters that these guys were writing home to their families saying, oh, it's really hard at first, but when, once you get used to it, you know, you, you don't feel so bad anymore. And they'd be doing this to us, you know, if the war was going the other way and so on. So maybe you're right. Maybe, you know, they're, they're, those inner demons are in there. Uh, and, and, uh, and they vary amongst between people, of course, like all other traits. Yes, right. Um, and, uh, so, so I think uh, Adrian Rain again has done studies in which he um, looks at uh, psychopaths versus non-psychopaths and mm -hmm. finds that um, that psychopaths have a, a stronger. I can't remember exactly how he measured it, but um, I I think it was amygdala activity. It was activity in some part of the limbic system where uh, the emotional stimuli are ar arising, and. Uh, the implication, uh, as I understand it, is that uh, he found in psychopaths both uh, a higher level on average of emotional stimulus and a higher level of control. Mm. Oh, interesting. Right. All right, let's look at the uh, – uh, we've been going over an hour, so I want to just, just pull back and look at some of the bigger picture stuff here. You talk about the tyrant problem and the role of capital punishment, or of course they wouldn't have called it that, you know, 10,000 years ago, but, you know, executing bullies and psychopaths and, and another part of our self-domestication is, is just to weed out the most aggressive, proactively aggressive people in our, in our communities. Yes. I mean, so here's the problem. Um, we know that humans have got this very low tendency for reactive aggression compared to other species. Um, if you look at our anatomy now, it fits with like the anatomy of a domesticated animal. And if you go back three to 300,000 years ago, that was when we first get the anatomical signs of domestication. So it looks as though uh, about 300,000 years ago, selection pressures started to act against reactive aggression. And the question is, why would they do so? And the answer that I like to, uh, or the way in which I like to try and elicit an answer in uh, a species like ourselves, where we don't know what happened in the past, is to look to the present and say, okay, uh, nowadays, if we look in the appropriate society and we find a person who is excessively aggressive, then uh, what happens to control them? Now, the kind of society we should be looking at is a uh, hunter-gatherer society uh, in which people are living as mobile hunter-gatherers because uh, for uh, the last few hundred thousand years, that has been the only type of society on Earth. And that this is the type of society in which our evolutionary psychology was forged. So we go to the ethnographic literature on hunter-gatherer society. And uh, many people have looked at this, but um, most recently, Christopher Bohm in particular has done a wonderful series of, uh, of reviews of this material. And it's very clear uh, what the answer is. If a man gets out of hand to the point where he is really being a threat to other people in his group, groups we're talking about are you know, 25, 40, 50 people, not, not, not huge, then uh, there are no prisons, there is no state 
apparatus to appeal to. You know, you can't call the police. <laughs> You're just on your own in the bush. And this guy is being a total jerk. And uh, there are various low level ways of trying to deal with him. Uh, uh, he is spoken to with humor. He's spoken to with severity. Uh, a song of, of derision is sung in his face. Uh, people try and ostracize him. Uh, there are all sorts of these mechanisms which actually mostly probably work because they're really, really painful. You know, if you're in a very small group and you're with people that that you know, the only people you've ever known and they all suddenly ostracize you and just refuse to acknowledge your existence, that is incredibly socially painful. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes the guy is a total asshole. And <laughs> uh, under those conditions, eventually, uh, they, there is a plot designed to kill him because there is no alternative. And that plot might be um, between just a few people, you know, just two or three decide to uh, shoot him in the back with an arrow when uh, they're all out hunting together. Uh, but if it's only a few of them, then they will be people who are pretty confident that the rest of the society will agree and forgive them. And sometimes you get a very um, wide, a community-wide plan that is generated to the point where uh, the community discusses how it's going to be done and who is going to do it. And under that actually you know, fairly common circumstance, um, <clears throat> then the decision is that the kin of the, the victim should be the ones who carry out the killing. And this makes sense because unless the kin do it, the kin might feel obliged to take revenge on the ones who did do the killing. But more importantly, in this context, I think what it shows is that this is a community taking a decision. And sometimes they all show their unanimity about this uh, subsequently. So, for instance, uh, the body might be killed by, you know, the victim might be killed by one or two people. But then everybody in the group comes along and sticks a weapon into the animal, uh, sorry, excuse me, uh, into the victim. <laughs> Uh, to sort of show their symbolic agreement mm. with mm. what's going on. And that's why I like to call this capital punishment, because it is it is commonly and socially decided. It's not just, um, you know, a uh, a fight that it's not a fight that breaks out. Yeah, uh, a uh, fight uh, that is planned. Christopher makes the point that, that this could be one of the impetuses of cooperation. And just another another example where humans have to cooperate because, as he points out, it's hard to kill somebody when you don't have guns and and uh, you know electric chairs and things like that. Uh, it takes, it, particularly these bullies, they tend to be big, strong men, and it's hard to break them down. And you you really need three or four guys to to work together on that. Yes. Um, so, so uh, Christopher Bohm, I think, um, you know, is a, the major figure in this area. Um, but it's really funny what happened with his 1999 book, Hierarchy in the Forest, where he really laid this all out beautifully for the first time. Because in that book, yes, he says that you need to be able to cooperate in order to be able to carry out the killings at all. And he also says that uh, a consequence of the killings is that people grow up in a society learning that if they behave badly, then they are going to be vulnerable to uh, this extreme punishment. And in that particular book, uh, that is where he leaves it. He doesn't go into the genetic argument, mm. where the genetic argument would be uh, a consequence of capital punishment exerted against uh, violent men is that there will be selection against the violent men's genes. Uh, Bohm, in his 1999 book, leaves it at the cultural consequence. Mm. People just learning that it's a bad idea to be too violent because you will get killed. And what, what I never realized until recently is that he had, in fact, already considered the genetic consequences elsewhere. He just didn't want to sort of complicate uh, that well, particular Well, he, he probably saw what happened in Napoleon Shagnon. People are very sensitive about these sorts yes. of issues, and you yeah. have to take them very, very carefully. Yeah. But, but in Bohm's 2012 book, you know, 13 years later, he really brings it out, his book Moral Origins. And, and there, I think he's absolutely right uh, to emphasize the fact that there are very important 
genetic consequences of systematic killing of those men who are excessively aggressive. And I think that those consequences, I think just like uh, Boehm, although even more so in a way, um, that those genetic consequences include two kinds of things. One is it, it um, reduces the frequency of the genes for reactive aggression, to put it simply. Mm -hmm. it, it makes us a, a more domesticated-like species. That's from the point of view of, of producing reactively aggression. The second thing it does is to uh, lead to a, an evolution of uh, the moral senses. Uh, and, and here I think I'm very much agreeing with Bohem, who's led the way on this, uh, because the argument is this, that once you have a, a group of men who have learned that they have the power to control the big bully alpha male who has been kicking sand in your face and taking your meat and <laughs> stealing your wife and all that sort of stuff, you've learned that you can kill him. Well, now what? Well, who else can you kill? And the mm. answer is everybody. Mm. And under those conditions, I think that you have a totally unique, unique to humans, uh, uh, selection pressure for conformity, for behavioral conformity. So now, an individual who says to himself, you know, you know those old ways of doing business who cares? You know, I don't need to be as polite as they're sort of <laughs> suggesting. I'll just sort of, you know, steal a bit of food from that old woman and, and who cares? Uh, that kind of person is now vulnerable to the group of men who say, uh, we don't want you to behave like that. And if you do, if you persist like that, we will kill you. And, you know, I, I lived in um, northeastern Congo um, with... Um, uh, small-scale farmers and, and hunter-gatherers for uh, nine months, um, 40 years ago. And so we got to know people in the village very well. And I saw what happens uh, when somebody is not, not a, a sort of extreme uh, nonconformist, but just got a little bit of sort of their own ways, you know, that not very good at making up with other people and uh, somewhat their own opinions about uh, when to plant their crops or uh, where to go hunting and so on, just, you know, an individual. And he, people like that are regarded as a witch. Mm. And if some misfortune happens in the society, mm. then maybe it's the witch's fault. Mm. And what should we do about it? Well, nowadays they're not killing them, but, you know, it was very easy to imagine that people like that only a hundred years ago would have been burned just quietly got rid of yeah so you know i'm very much in in line with bohm's thinking on this that that the emergence of this um stark coalitionary power of men who can form a plan together and decide to carry it out against even the biggest bully the power they represent is a power that is going to lead to a very strong moral sense in um, everybody in the camp, which is that, oh, I don't want to be seen as a, a nonconformist. And if it comes to me being seen to be selfish at the expense of the group, then maybe I should invest in the good of the group. So, yes, please share my food. <laughs> and yes, of course, I'll look after your baby. And, you know, all these other good things, I think they come from a dark background. Right. See there, I would arg I argue that you can't, but you can't just fake being a nice, good person. You actually have to believe it. You got to live it. You got to sell it, and and that means because as as Bob Trivers points out, it, it, you know, there's deception and self deception. If you're just deceiving without deceiving yourself, your fellow group members are going to pick up cues that you're just faking. You're just being manipulative. So you got to really believe it, and that, yes. and, that, and that's a form of real morality, I think. If I don't know where else you're going to get it since I'm an atheist. I don't think it comes from on high. So it comes from within. But it, it, And that's as good as it gets. If you really believe that you feel right about helping somebody, that's morality. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that, that's fine. Um, I, and I'm, I, I totally agree with you about the, the point that the, the best way to convince someone else that, that you are genuinely um, 
uh, concerned about their feelings or uh, concerned about being nice to them uh, is to convince yourself. Now, I mentioned uh, <clears throat> Napoleon Shagnon. He got into trouble for our listeners back in the 90s when there was this book by uh, a journalist named Tierney, Darkness in Patrick. Alvarado. Yeah, uh, Patrick Tierney, yeah. So uh, accusing Napoleon of, of essentially uh, planting the seeds of violence among the Yanomamo who were otherwise a peaceful people because our ancestors were peaceful, the noble savage, the Rousseau image. You talk about Rousseau in your book. Uh, that whole noble savage thing, that, that 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 whole debate keeps coming up again and again because we have this sense that that um, that deep inside we're good people instead of sort of recognizing that we have these multiple multiple dimensions. And uh, so for for just just the subtitle of his book, Yana Mamo, the fierce people. You know, he he got pushed back on that, even though he said, look, you know, when they make love, they're not fierce. When they eat, they're not fierce. I mean, they're not yeah. fierce most of the time, but there's right. just this little, there's going to be some genetic uh, effects there of, of aggression or whatever. Anyway, so. Uh, yeah, in your a, book, you, you, you cited the quiet family life of, of the Anamamo, and, <laughs> right. and I actually cited you in my book, uh, you know, <laughs> yes. because you ha- you've got some quotes out of Shagnon that uh, I hadn't seen published elsewhere. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So that brings us to the last question, uh, the, big, the big question at the end of your book on war. Again, there's this sense of that that you know uh, I think they're called the uh, the peace and harmony mafia that yes, that, is, right. that insists that you know we were noble savages and peaceful and and I used to believe that I read Conrad Lorenz's book his 1966 book so I read that in college in the early 70s and thinking yep that's right uh, you know he argued that uh, you know primitive war or early war would have just been ritualistic. Uh, like counting coup, like Native Americans, you you sneak into the other camp and you touch the person on the head while they're sleeping, you, but you don't kill them, and that's a victory, and that it's all symbolic. Well, that looks pretty much like that's debunked now, right? Yes, I mean, and it's it's understandable because um, there have been societies in which uh, they have um, regular kind of ritual meetings, uh, which are sort of semi-war, uh, where. Uh, well, the, the the classic example is the the Dani, uh, made famous by um, the uh, the film uh, organized by Carl Haider, uh, where mm. this is in upland uh, Highland New Guinea, and uh, uh, the uh, there was a, a team from from Harvard, uh, Carl Haider, and and included uh, Michael Rockefeller doing the sound, uh, and they went and filmed. Primitive war, and what they saw in the film, it's called Dead Birds, and it's still seen on college campuses, and it's still, you know, it's a great movie, although one wants to take it in context, uh, but but it's genuine what you see, which is um, masses of, of people, uh, men, I mean, maybe you know, a few score, uh, running nervously towards each other in a sort of a, a rough front, uh, lots of screaming and excitement, but what you do not see is any kind of uh, coordinated phalanx that is sort of pushing ahead um, and uh, and taking losses uh, while uh, attacking the other group. You just see on both sides lots of men running around. And then at some point someone gets hurt and then uh, the people on that side uh, run away and, and the battle is over. So this rather incoherent description I've just given uh, is um, meant to capture the fact that these are not battles of the type that we are familiar with mm-hmm. from seeing movies about World War I or something. Um, you do not get many people killed in those sorts of things at all. And in fact, it's almost accidental when someone gets killed. However, on the other hand, you also have, and increasingly now we, we are aware of of uh, how frequently and consistently this happened, you get raids in which people really do attempt to kill each other. And the raid is a asymmetric interaction where the victims don't know that it's happening. Uh, and the uh, attackers, they might use an ambush or they might use a, a, a raid deep into enemy territory to try and maybe reach a, a distant village uh, in early dawn wait for some man to come stumbling out to have a pee, uh, (laughs) then you put your spear into him and then you run away again. And those are the interactions in which uh, enough people get killed that the the, uh, chances of death mount up over time. 
So where were we? <laughs> when I started well, we were, we were talking about uh, ultimately talking about war. Uh, and, you know, the evidence from archaeology uh, that, you know, uh, you know, the percentage of young males who died violently in these archaeological sites is pretty high. So although there may be some ritualistic conflicts like you described, it looks like overwhelmingly that, that, that the rates of violence were much higher, and not just within the group, but between groups. Now, whether, maybe war is not the right word because, you know, we, we envision World War I or something. Obviously, it's not like that. But just just people killing people between groups at high percentages uh, was more common than it is now. Uh, yes, right. I mean, the astonishing thing in the collections of uh, demographic data from societies that were able to be at war in the sense of um, being neighbored by technologically equivalent societies is that if you take uh, Germany, Russia, uh, Sweden and, uh, and, and Japan, uh, then uh, they all have, during the 20th century, having gone through World War I and World War II, uh, significantly lower rates of violence from being killed uh, in war than the typical small-scale society. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. Those are the data that Lawrence Keeley right. assembled uh, in the 1990s. And um, uh, you, know, we, you can certainly argue about individual cases, but the overall pattern seems seems pretty clear that... Uh, although there's great variation among societies at any one time, nevertheless, the overall pattern uh, is uh, quite a lot of people dying from being killed by the enemy. Right. So what has happened? Well, two things. In your book, we've been self-domesticated. And then also civilization, as you point out, uh, contrasting Rousseau with Huxley, uh, that we've implemented call them governmental or social technologies, to squelch the rest of the kind of violence we don't like through the legal system and courts and democracy and trade and, and so forth. All these add up to an expansion of our empathy to people not in our group. And that seems to me a pretty optimistic combination. Yes, and, and of course, uh, we drifted into Stephen Pinker territory here, I yeah, think, uh, yeah. where he, he does the, uh, the heavy lifting in terms of that kind of analysis. Um, I think the thing, the point that I would want to make about this is that um, the, the capacity that humans have for proactive violence, um, it, which is what almost overwhelmingly uh, happens in intergroup aggression, uh, call it war, uh, that capacity is something that is a little bit sort of different from reactive aggression in the sense that it is not provoked by uh, somebody doing something immediate. Uh, it is uh, provoked by thinking about the circumstances under which to do it and whether to do it. Now, it may seem as though in humans uh, we are different from animals in this respect, but I don't think we are. Uh, you know, animals' thinking may be much less complicated than ours, but ne nevertheless, somehow, the way in which animals conduct proactive aggression is similar to us in this sense, that they don't do it if there's a risk of the aggressors being hurt. Mm. So, you know, there's this astonishing thing with chimps, where uh, you've got a chimp victim being killed by uh, the enemy, here he is, three or four times as strong as a human, fighting for his life. Uh, he will end up not just dead, but wounded all over his body. I mean, just, just cuts all over, uh, and maybe his thorax is torn out, and testicles in different places, and uh, just a total mess. And you look at the aggressors, and what has happened to them? Basically nothing. Mm -hmm. They have no wounds, maybe a couple of scratches. Why? Because they're really good at judging when to do these attacks. They will only do them when they have really overwhelming power. And the same is equivalently true in, um, in other species that commit proactive aggression, uh, such as um, male monkeys that kill uh, infants uh, of um, uh, the, the, the offspring uh, from other males. 
They're killing them to get their own reproductive advantage. But the question is, under what circumstances do they kill them? And the answer is only when the mother is not going to be able to get a rally of females who will attack back and hurt the male. He just does it by surprise occasionally when he can do it safely. Uh, so in animals, proactive aggression is done safely. And in humans, proactive aggression is done safely. Accidents happen, of course. You know, you may go on a raid to attack another village and you didn't realize that uh, the village has protected itself with spikes dug in the ground uh, <laughs> so that it will be, you know, dangerous. But the overall psychology is don't attack unless you've got an overwhelming imbalance of power. So the reason I'm emphasizing this point is that this seems to me to be an optimistic perspective from thinking about the application of an evolutionary psychology to problems of warfare and human aggression. That as long as we have institutions that maintain reasonable balances of power uh, among nations or groups within nations or groups that cut across nations, uh, then you do not expect that humans will use the terrible powers that we have now assembled to be able to kill each other. Yeah, and that way mutual assured destruction is a logical game theoretic stance to hold. The, the problem is we've never adapted no first use. The no first use thing would be super important. And no, um, what is it, um, launch on on uh, launch on command or whatever it's called. Or no, la la launch on alert or something like that. If you just, It could be a flock of birds and you launch your missiles anyway. Yes, right. Um, those, two, th those two elements make it very risky still. But as right. a strategy, you know, I can see why Kim Jong-un wants nukes because now he's a, a big player at the world table. It's true. And America doesn't mess around with countries that have nukes. <laughs> you know, from his right. perspective, it looks like it's no, that is absolutely right. And of course, you know, the alarming big picture is that it's very hard to imagine how uh, other countries are not slowly going to get them, you know, right. over time, country by country. And what's alarming about that is not so much that there would be uh, some madman who deliberately uses them, because you know, that is evolutionarily, psychologically unlikely right um, because you know the nice thing about mutual assault destruction is that our evolutionary psychology comes adapted to recognize the sense of that right um, no the alarming thing of course is that accidents will happen right well let's hope we avoid that <laughs> and okay. i mean yeah. you know all the fuss about kim jong-un and and say syria and iran you know, as Pinker points out, you know, centuries ago, there were two dozen Kim Jong-uns in the world or maybe more. And, you know, just, uh, you know, always til til tilting on the edge of chaos and war and conflict. Uh, you know, European countries at war with each other pretty much every other year for 500 years. Now, you can't imagine France and Germany invading each other. It just seems absurd. I suppose so. Although, you know, there were uh, sort of exotic, um, optimistic peace treaties in the 1930s. Yeah, that didn't I mean, work. Yes, that's Europe. right. Yeah, uh, yeah so that's right. I, I wrote about that. The, the Kellogg, Brian Kellogg treaties in 1927 that outlawed war. Well, so much for that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. right. So, it's not always totally successful. He, yes. But the fact that there's still criminals and burglars doesn't mean we shouldn't have laws against criminality and burglary <laughs> so anyway yeah. Richard no, but what it does mean I mean is you know the um, the attitude that uh, uh, that Trump is taking now uh, with many social institutions I think is is very dangerous mm -hmm. you know because um, the 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 tendency to say well you don't really need these social institutions because you know and there'll, there'll be a series of arguments um, it um, is at variance with the notion that the institutions have very often been built up in specific ways to uh, avert the dangers of war and to maintain good relationships among groups. You mean like NATO? So without going into any kind of details that I yeah. probably would fumble on anyway, it just seems to me that people ought to be very aware that um, it, it is foolish to take the view that people who are left in a more anarchic world will behave well. They won't. No, they, no, we they, see what happens. Uh, that oh, I had Naomi, um, uh, uh, sorry, is? no, Rachel Kleinfeld, uh, mm -hmm. her book, A Savage Order. It's about what happens when states fail 
around okay, the world. Okay, exactly. And, uh, and so, you know, libertarians like to, to, to call up Hayek about self-organized groups that, you know, without a government, we, we get together and we write the rules and we enforce the rules and so on. Actually, what happens is mafioso gangs arise up and they enforce justice themselves. And this leads to high rates of violence. As they've done in Libya and after yep. Gaddafi, as they've done in yep. Yugoslavia. Yeah, uh, the Republic of Georgia she went to and studied. And, you know, so in a way, P uh, Russians like Putin because he's a, you know, he's a strong man that came down and squash, squashed all those mafioso-type gangs. Uh-huh, yes, yes, okay, right. Uh, even though we think he's a bad guy because, you know, he's doing all these things that, you know, we don't like. But, uh, but from the Russian perspective, at least he squelched all the... You know the bad the the bad dudes. <laughs> that yeah, that's a very valid perspective, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Well, Richard, we've been going over an hour and a half, uh, so let's wrap it up. the The book is the Goodness Paradox: The Strange Relationship Between Virtue and Violence in Human Evolution. Really, it's a great book. It's one of the, I think, it's going on the shelf along with uh, Pinker and some of the other uh, important works there on. Uh, to, to me, on the optimism shelf, that you Good, know, okay. that, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that I mean, you've added another element to Pinker's in my own optimism. You know, there, there's a deeper, you know, in, in our nature. There's a those those inner demons really have been put put in check by the better angels, and some of those better angels are part of our nature, not just culture, but part of our nature. So exactly, I love right. that. I love that part of your book. So congratulations. What what are you going to work on next? What's what's next on the docket? Uh, I'm not not absolutely sure. I'm I'm sort of choosing among uh, possibilities. But uh, th you know, the thing that I I spent less time than I expected to in that book uh, was about gender, mm. Ooh, uh, right? And and, uh, and the role of women and uh, and the way in which uh, men um, mistreat women, not just uh, as individuals, uh, but the way that so much of patriarchy is culturally instantiated in the sense that uh, you know all, all men somehow agree on laws and other mm -hmm. institutions that benefit themselves at the expense of women. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a super important subject. Be, better be very careful on that. It's a very politically I, sensitive. I, I say, I'm still thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would do that, yeah. No, that's a, in the moral arc, I make the point that I, I'm pro-choice, but barely I recognize the arguments from the pro-lifers that it's a, it's, a, it's a living being and so forth. But my main argument is that because men have controlled women's reproductive rights for all of all of evolutionary history that, you know, part of the moral arc is expanding rights to people that have never had rights. And, yep. and the patriarchy has always controlled women for very good evolutionary reasons, you know, the uh, just paternity uncertainty and all that stuff, but that doesn't make it right. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's great that you're, you're pushing that. <laughs> yeah. So, all right, Richard, thank you so much. Great book. Okay. Congratulations. Talk to you great soon. Great to talk to you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.